Looking to sleep better? Try Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers and get seven forms of magnesium in each capsule. Click the link in the description or pinned comment to save 10%. Matthew, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Relatively well today, Jesse. Um, doing, yeah, I had a great night's sleep, which helps <laughs> a lot. I average about nine and a half hours. Uh, I'm privileged to be able to say that. Thank you. My wife lets me do that. But as she says, she'd rather be around me after nine and a half hours sleep than wake me up earlier and be around me with less than that sleep. So I hear you guys are going through some challenging times where you live. There's been a lot of uncharacteristic snowfall. Yeah. And I saw on your Instagram that you're you're taking a stand and you're you're being a leader in this and trying to help people that are are going through challenging times. So talk about yeah. talk about how uncharacteristic this is and and what's going on where you live. So, you know, we're in Texas. We are not prepared. Our energy systems just proved they were not prepared for winters and freezes like we just had. You're prepared in the north, prepared in Wisconsin, um, and a freeze came through, the worst freeze in 71 years in Texas, and our energy systems failed us. Uh, Things weren't insulated, pipes froze, pumps froze, um, and we lost power. And then the big problem, the longer-term problem, because now most of the power is restored, is is water lines froze. So you have now endless pipes that have busted. Uh, uh, even hospitals were locked up there for a while. But right now we, we have a, a major amount of residential uh, homes where pipes are busted, they can't get clean water. Um, they couldn't get clean water. They, they were out without electricity, they couldn't get food. So we have immediate needs of food, water, and when it was fro- freezing, blankets and such. Well, now we're back up to in the 70s, Snow is melted. We still need plumbers for a long time. People are going to need clean water for a long time. Texas just opened up and allowed plumbers from out of state to come in and get licensed in Texas. We've got long-term plans to say, hey, how do we insulate so this doesn't happen again? But the benefit is going to be about the immediate needs of, of people that need it, and some, whether that's clean water, whether that's getting access to getting their plumbing fixed so they can be up and running again, and then the mid and long-term needs, which are you're going to have to have water flowing again. You're going to have to re- you're going to have to assess damage. You're going to ha- and there's I think we have to start with who are the elders that can't help themselves? Who are the people that are in the have not sections that cannot help themselves and how can we go help them first the most in need? And then hopefully we'll all be um up and running and back in flow and I don't know how many months from now, but I'm saying and understanding that it's definitely months from now. I hope so and wishing you guys all the best. And I'm just curious Matthew, when something like this happens, what is it about you and, and your makeup that makes you, you know, not just stand by and, and watch as, you know, you talked about the have nots, right? You're, you're standing up for the have nots as somebody, you know, you, you have privilege and, and money and right. fame and what, what makes you reach out and, and help those that don't have as much? Well, I think something that, you know, this year, whole year, last year, over the year, there's been a clear purpose that was introduced with all of us. The only word that I maybe need to take back there is clear. (laughs) COVID gave us all a new sense of, it disrupted our lives. We had to change things in our life. Uh, I had to look at who was most vulnerable in our families. How do we protect them? What's my choice? There was not a consensus with which how to do it, but we knew we had new purpose. We just had to figure out in this limbo. Something like this comes along, a freeze in Texas. It's a very clear definitive purpose in a time and place. It is a problem that we know we can fix. It has a clear third act. We'll get people, you know, there will be harm, people harmed along the way, but it has a clear act. We're not going, oh, Texas is stuck without plumbing for the rest of time. No, we're going to get the power grid. Power grid's already back up. So it's got a clear purpose and it's got a timely call to action. It needs to happen right now. I mean, the, 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 the mess is happening. It's acute right now in Texas. So I think that when when something comes up, if I'm in a position where I can help, which, you know, I can, Camilla and I do stuff on the ground, but I'm also very aware of the platform we have. And I have a megaphone. I can make phone calls to reach out. Can we form some sort of entertainment, an hour or two of entertainment coming up here in the next two weeks that people that would people would demand and say, so, hey, can we supply that demand and, and say, hey, well, I'll come into there and I'd like to I'd like to donate 20 bucks to that. I'd like to donate five bucks, I'd like to donate a thousand bucks. Can we get this underwritten as an event? And 
funnel all the money to the places it's going to need to go for some time. Because here's the challenge with these things. As you know, <laughs> in the when you're raising funds to try and help out a, a, a crisis, a new crisis is coming. And so I want to get in there before we're on page 14 of the crisis because everyone jumps at the beginning, but then you kind of ride out of town and there's a lot of help that's left and needed for a long time. So right now we got Texas has to stabilize. Then we got to organize, then we respond. So I'm coming in in the stabilization organized side and hopefully in there for the long term for the response side. But a, a clear purpose. It happens. It's acute. Oh my gosh, things froze. People, no, 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 no power, no water. What can we do? That's the first question that comes to it. And Camilla is the one who kind of nudged me and really pushed me. You know, she 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 talked to uh, uh, First Lady and she said, look, power's coming back up, but water's going to be a problem for a while. And that's when, when my mind was like, boy, basic necessity for Texas for a while? Plumbers. Well, it's very honorable. And, and you guys, like you said, have the megaphone and it's just so wonderful that you're using it to do good. And I want to pivot a little bit, Matthew, and talk about your latest book, Green Lights. I just yeah. love the read. I love the vulnerability, the stories. And I'm just curious, as somebody who has been in the public eye for so long and being vulnerable as an actor, where you're actually portraying somebody else, this is totally different for you, where you're sharing stories from your life and and you're getting real and, and open. So talk about how much, how different that was for you to put all that out there. Yeah, well, let me start by saying this. Um, the best performances, the best movies, the best fictional movies in my mind, and I think this is true for some, for, for a lot of people, are the ones that feel like they're nonfiction, are the ones that feel like, oh, this is a documentary. This really happened. This is really a place. That's really a character. That scenario really happened. Wow, where was I? And then you find out it's fiction, and you go, but if it's fiction, they told it in a way that makes you go, oh, was that real? That means we made you believe. That's well told. Well, that's my favorite kind of stories. So I just said, hey, instead of playing some other character that somebody else wrote for you, that somebody else directed, that somebody else put lens in a camera, that somebody else edited, go write your own story. Who's the character you've been? And it's nonfiction. And I looked at it and I was like, well, is it, is it, is it, is it worth sharing? Is it educational, enlightening, entertaining? And I was like, well, it's damn sure entertaining. <laughs> Okay, so there's one part. Um, and yeah, you know what? It's kind of it's, it's educational. There's some wind and yeah, maybe there's some enlightenment in there too. You've learned some things. Oh, wow. I didn't know, you know, found some consistency, things I learned, things I'm still learning in there that I said, oh, those can scale out to humanity, to other people in particular they can see in my life. And very quickly, my hope was, and I think I'm, 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 I'm going to be confident enough to say I believe this is true. Very early in the book, it's very clear that we're not talking about Matthew McConaughey, the celebrity. Now, you're going to come into the book and I'm going to have, there's going to be some packing or unpacking to do with, well, he's a celebrity. So you may go, that question, oh my gosh, why would he be so vulnerable and so honest in his position? Or I didn't know, I didn't think maybe that kind of stuff happened to him as well. I was, you know, one of my first notes I wrote to myself on day three, I think, of writing the book was, the words on the pages of this book need to be worthy of being shared if they're signed by anonymous. And at the same time, the words on the pages need to be a book that only Matthew McConaughey could have written. So that was my sort of measurement. Buddy, I wasn't interested in writing a celebrity memoir. I wasn't interested in doing a tell-all book. I was a liver and a mammal and a child of God and a citizen long before I was a damn celebrity. I want to talk about that, that, that part. And celebrity has been part of my life. Um, so, and then again, checking in on the in, in education and the enlightenment side. Where did I have things worth sharing? That would be worth sharing if they were signed by John or Jane Doe. That's what I mean by signed by anonymous. Um, and then also after it's done, did I hear and see a voice that I went like only McConaughey could have written that. So that was my goal that I was going for. Um, and the vulnerability that people keep saying, I was like, that's really the was the most fun stuff. My I'm my family knows most of these stories. We talk about them. We love pointing out our warts and foibles and screw ups, and we laugh at them. As you know from the book, we laugh at them very quickly. We get up, dust ourselves off, and kind of incorporate that as a part of life rather than an anomaly very quickly. Um, 
And I guess a lot of people don't practice or do that as 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 much. But if 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 this book inspires them to to do that a little bit more, and sort of be more transparent about our screw ups or our things when we thought we had our plans all perfectly lined up and they turned out not to go out down how we thought they should, that life is full of calibrations and recalibrations. That hey, we're all on this journey of it. Um, that's the point. Stay in the game. Stay in the race. Commit to the chase. Um, then good. Then I think that's a healthy thing to share. Well, I think a fun thing to share. Well, I think one thing that's really powerful, and you alluded to this, is the fact that you are a celebrity, and you're sharing all these vulnerabilities. And even people that don't have celebrity status, this is something I think people need to do more of because it connects us as individuals, whether celebrity or not. It's like we can relate to these stories and these challenges that you've been through. And there's an extra layer to it because of the celebrity status. And it's interesting, over the years, up until more recently with the internet, celebrities have been very curated. You know, you get to see Matthew McConaughey in the movie and then on very tight, right. almost scripted type interviews uh, that are five or 10 minutes on the late night talk show. And, and here you are, me and you having a conversation. It's going to be an hour and 15 minutes. We don't know where it's going. Like, this is so different for for celebrities to go and, and just riff with somebody. And, and this is vulnerable in the, in the same kind of way. And I think that's why it's going to connect with people in such a big way. Well, you bring up a good point because it's true. Celebrities, and, and I'm not judging this because in a lot of ways, there's it, it has worked in the past. And, it's, and it was a nice disconnect between the general public and a celebrity. We enjoy going, oh, I can only be with her or him on that Friday night when their movie comes out two months from now. And I look forward to that. There's great, you know, there was a, a you, there was a, a more of a gap between how can I get them or, or oh, they're going to be on a special appearance. I'm watching because it's exclusive material. I would say even before, you know, living my life like this and you and I talking for 75 minutes and we're, we're, we're live in a long form discussion and I've been talking about things for 17 weeks and enjoying it. I would say even before that though, I was never, I never wanted to be a celebrity that chose to insulate myself. I didn't want to work. It was too hard to work the wrong kind of work for me to go. We got to stay out of sight. I'm going to stay out of sight and out of mind. I'm going to, until, you know, I'm going to build up anticipation until my movie comes out. Now I know celebrities that do that. And there's it is a great asset to that because their box office is arguably higher sometimes because people are like, I've got to go see them because this is the this is exclusive. So there's it's a it's actually very smart for business in many ways. I just was always like, I'm it's too much effort. I got I got too many things I like to do as a citizen and as a father and as a family man and places I want to go. I never was comfortable with, oh, hey, I'll give you a good example. New York City. I'm sitting there getting ready to go do a show. We're in an apartment, in a hotel, actually. The lady who's doing my makeup, husband was a New York City fire chief. My son was with me. He's four. <gasps> fire chief. I love fire trucks. She goes, hey, I can call him. He, he's out and he doesn't have a car right now. He'll swing by in his fire truck. Wow, wow. Great, 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 great. Well, five minutes later, I pulls a fire truck outside of the hotel. My son, we got to go see the fire truck. Got to go see the fire. I'm like, yeah, we got to go see the fire truck. We go down there. Son's in the fire truck. All of a sudden, while we're doing that, no I, I noticed, I click back into, oh, you're McConaughey and you're your son. You're outside of a hotel down in downtown Soho, New York. This is paparazzi. There's 60 of them around. And I'm like, ah, oh. and it hits me. Wait a minute. Do I, what comes first here? My son's pure one of seeing his first fire truck, which he's seeing, or the fact that, wait a minute, this is not the ideal place to do it. I didn't plan to come down here. I didn't want to be documented. I didn't even think of that. Uh, uh, and, and I, in the media, in the moment, was like, no, no, no. The fact that my son wants to see his first fire truck and gets to see his first fire truck is going to have the choice of what I'm going with. Damn it, I didn't want to be documented and have the Discovery Channel here, as I call them, cover and take snapshots of me and my son. But this is his first fire truck. I can't pull him from this. I'm not going to pull him from this. Now, mind you, we didn't hang out for an hour, but he got to see his first fire truck when we came back up. But it, 
I always was like, I'm still, even b- b- before now, I've always been like, well, what's our right as a, as a citizen, as a liver, as, as the father? Uh, before, what are my rights or the restrictions as a celebrity? So I was never one that would give you that a totally exclusive content because I was kind of living my life somewhat out loud, you know, outside of the gates. Now, I've never been foolish try to be foolish with my celebrity. And there's certain things I do have to protect family and things I have to protect. Um, but my, my, my goal, I, I was never, it was always too much work to insulate myself too much. Um, and now this, I don't know. I, I've said this, I want my goal in writing the book and also in living my life moving from here is I'm trying to get rid of these filters. Meaning I spoke about filters earlier. When I act, there's someone else's script, someone else's directing, someone else's lensing me in the camera, someone else's editing before my raw expression gets to you. Well, there's certain filters we're talking about with celebrity insulation. Those are filters from keeping me moving freely. I'm trying to get rid of those damn filters and go, what are we doing here in the big show? L-I-F-E. What, what man am I going to be in that? What, what, what character am I playing in that? Hey, you want to talk about this book? Thank you. That means it translated to you. I'd love to talk about it with you, Jesse. I'm honored with the book. And you're, you, you want to talk to me on the show because you read the book and it translated to you. I want to know about that human interaction. I want to know what translated. I want to know what's, what was particular to you in a way that, that was not my story. You know, so I'm enjoying this and this filterless conversation immensely. I want to come back to something you touched on there, the fire truck story, and and you touched on how with family it's a little bit different. And I want to go a bit deeper into that because it is one thing, you know, back when you were single and you had celebrity status and you, you know, you wanted to go in public or, or run on the beach shirtless or whatever, and you know the paparazzi is going to be around and and you know taking photos. But then now you're a married man with three kids, so how did you go about forming that boundary, that insulation? as your family grew? Yeah. Um, it's an art. I haven't, I don't know if we've quite figured it out, but I think we do a pretty good job of it. You know, we're trying to instill in our kids the same thing. I was just talking to you. Hey, you move freely. You, you have a right to move freely in the world as a, as a, as a person, as a child, as a young man, as a young woman, as a citizen. You, so, so you move freely. Who were you born into? An affluent situation where a world likes to document things that your father and mother do. And you're an extension of us, so that means they're going to want to document you. This is not going to happen with all your friends. This will be different. So, but don't not do things in the world because of, for fear that that might happen. Move your own way. Behave and be yourself and go out. Now, at the same time, Camilla and I have always been this way, and we try to say we're not yet. We're now getting to the point where maybe we'll start to. I think our kids inherently understand it, but we may have to teach them this. It's like never go looking for it. We're never trying to advertise. We've never. I, there's never a time where I'm like, oh, I'm glad. I want the paparazzi there, or oh, it's good if there's our lives being documented, or oh, I'm so happy somebody pulled up a camera and took and took us up. No, we like it's not. It's a little more relaxing to have your privacy. I think anybody can understand that. So we don't want to go advertise and look for the attention. At the same time, as I said, the fire truck story. Don't want to, hey, it's a beautiful day. Kids want to, we happen to be at a friend's house in Malibu. You want to go out on the beach? Wow, there's, I hear there's a camera paparazzi out there. Oh, so do we unpack the beach bag and take the lunch out of the Tupperwares and put the towels back up and sit inside and say, we live next, you know, we're staying next to the beach, but we're not going to go out there, kids, because there's some with the camera. I don't know. I don't want that message sent to the kids either. Because I'm like, in, in, the, in, in the, I always look to get relative. I'd always said this, you know, and this happened to me early on in my career when I had a driver and security and they were one night doing 90 miles an hour running red lights. And I was like, what are we running from? And they're like, paparazzi back behind us. And I was like, we got home and it was all exciting. All of a sudden my brother goes, hey, little buddy. Aren't those people chasing you? They just got cameras, right? Not guns. And I was like, yeah, why were we running red lights doing 90? What was going on? It was like it was a coup or something. So it can be exaggerated. Um, so we go on with the family. We try to move freely. Um, uh, we try to 
live our life as we would if it was not being documented. Uh, we have had many circumstances where we're going someplace on a family trip and we're being followed by somebody that wants to document the whole trip. And I'll just pull over the side of the road and get out and go, can everybody just get out here? What's the, what, what, do you, what do you want? Because we're going away for the weekend. And what we're not going to do is live the entire weekend looking out our window, wondering if you're looking in. We're not going to go spend the entire weekend wondering if the, the, the curtain in this mountain lodge is perfectly shut when my kid's taking a shower, you know, because you might be. Oh, so let's what do you want? Well, you know, what we need is a family picture. Okay, here we tell you what. We're going in this, we're going in this side, we're going in this roadside store right now. We're going in, we're all going to take a leak. We're coming back out. We're going to get something to drink on the way out. You want to get your shot? Get it here. If you'll go home, that'd be great. And a lot of times they've acquiesced and gone, okay, we'll give you that privacy. And turned around, get gotten their shot and turned around and got back home. So I'll barter sometimes. You know, to to say, oh, if we're going to be in a location for a long period of time, instead of every single day wondering if, you know, you're picking your nose or the curtain's back and someone's caught in an awkward position, they're shooting inside the house or on the property. Instead of that, every day, I'll, I'll sometimes barter going, hey, what shot do you need? We're going to the zoo today. You want to get a shot of us coming out of the zoo? Is that what you need? Say, yeah, that's the one. We need. Great. Get that one. And then can you move on? And a lot of times they'll never see him again. So that's how we try to roll with it. Seems like a good way to handle it. And it's interesting, Matthew, for you, you got projected into the spotlight. You share the story in the book basically over a weekend. You're mm. in a time to kill and and tell the story. I'll set it up for you, but I want to hear yeah. this is a Friday, a time to kill is about to launch and uh and you're you're walking about as as a regular citizen. Yeah. I'm walking as citizen Matthew McConaughey through the Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica, California. It's a Friday early afternoon, and I have a movie, my first real lead in a big studio movie, Time to Kill, that opens up in theaters that night. I'm walking down the promenade. There's 400 people on the promenade. I've walked down this promenade many times. 396 of the people are minding their own business. Four people are checking me out. A few girls to think I'm cute. Somebody likes my shoes. That's about it. I go get my tuna fish sandwich, pickles, ketchup on the side. I go back home, blah, blah, blah. With that weekend, that Friday night, Time to Kill does very well in the box office. A lot of people go see it in the theater through America. That Saturday, it does even better. Sunday, it does great too. All of a sudden, that Monday, I go back down to the promenade the same time of day as I did last Friday to go get my tuna fish sandwich with pickle and ketchup on the side. 400 people on the promenade. But all of a sudden now, 396 of them are staring at me and four minding their own business. Whoa, I can feel it. I got very conscious of myself. Why is everyone looking at me? Again, you do. They look around the nose, fly open, know we're good. What's going on? Why is everyone looking? You can feel it. I could feel it. Um, it was the world became a mirror over that weekend. Now, that happened in the public. That's the day I got famous. That's when I was like, oh, you're famous. Wow, cool, shit. All at the same time. <laughs> it was like, whoa. Um, because now I noticed everyone, and from then on, it's very hard to meet strangers. That's the, that's the, the coup of celebrity. Everyone has a, a biography on you, or at least the idea of a biography. And I, I would notice things that would like, it was, it was, it was hard to get balanced because people would come up and they'd go like, oh my God, how's Miss Hud? I'm so sorry. And I haven't ever met this person. The person just came up and said, the name of my dog, which I didn't know how they knew. I haven't met them first, but they already know the name of my dog. They know her name. They know I have a dog. They know her name is Miss Hud. They know she has cancer and they're asking how she's doing. Well, there's, that's four, talk about four we missed, hi, how you doing? What's your name? Whatever conversation may lead to, oh, and you got a dog. Whatever conversation leads to me going, oh, yeah, and her name's Miss Hud. Whatever conversation leads to me, and she happens to have cancer right now, which that can take days and weeks and months in a relationship to come out. Well, people are coming up, and it's just, it was a bit like, how'd you know all this? You just trespassed. I feel like you trespassed. <laughs> I didn't invite, but you just came in. And so it was a bit jarring for a while because. People think they know you. People come in on the, in the, in the know. Intimate conversations are started uh, already in the, in the second act. The first act's gone. The first act of meeting someone 
is gone. Um, it happened in work as well, meaning that Friday before a time to kill, there was a hundred scripts I wanted to do, and ninety nine of them I couldn't do because they said no, you can't. You, that's not available to you. You can do this one. Well, over that weekend with the success of Time to Kill, on that same so said Monday that I walked down the promenade and three hundred ninety six people were staring at me, the scripts that I could do, the availability inverted as well. Now ninety nine of them were yes, you can do those, and there was only one no. So the roof of of options were taken off of my world in a business, in a career-wise as well. Now I'm getting told you can do, three days ago, you would have done any of these, but you could only do one. Now you can do, now you want to do all of them, but do more, and, you, and you can do 99. Well, uh, wait a minute. This is the old, now I can for the first time. Well, hell yeah, I want to do them, but I can't do all 99. Which one do I pick? What do I pick? You're asking me to be discerning and discriminate in my choices of what I, Matthew, want to do right now when three days ago I would have done any of these? I got to catch my breath. I need more than 24 hours in a day, but damn it, they're not giving them. Uh, 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 uh. And people are like, what do you want to do? You can do whatever you want. What do you want to do? Wow. Awesome. But like I said about fame, wow, cool, shit. <laughs> you know? It was too, you know, so what I had to do and I, and I and I'm so glad I made this decision. It kind of made itself on me. I had a hunch. I gotta. I have to get out to go somewhere on my own and hear myself think. Let memory catch up. Let me let this. What's happened to me? My floor has been shook in my life. I gotta go see what 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 matters and what doesn't. Who am I in this? Because when it happened to me, I did feel a bit numb. There's a bit of numbness. There's just the the amount of frequencies coming at me. At such at, at such a, an immense level and so acutely on a dime over a weekend, it happened. Was it was hard to measure what was real, what was not, what mattered, what didn't. So I um I went away on uh, one of my many backpack trips. It usually lasts about twenty two days, and um, uh, went off to a place where that no one knew my name, where all I was meeting was strangers. Where I will say this. And I write about this, but I, I love bringing this up because I, I think it's it's true for all of us. All of a sudden, with all of the sort of love and attention I was getting, and people saying, oh, I love you. And I'm like, I haven't even met you. I love you. I was like, I've said that like to four people in my life. You, Wow, this place is great. With all of that, I needed to go in the sense of what I was saying to find out what mattered, what didn't. And who was I? How much of this had I earned? How much of this love and affluence and options, and yes, you can do what you want. Did I earn? I needed to go to a place like I did to where my worth was only measured on the man they met when I got there and who I had been by the time I left. Meaning, first trip was to Peru. I meet strangers. Nobody knows what I do. I'm under a different name. The goodbye 22 days later, the hugs and the tears I needed those hugs and tears from the people I had met when I left 22 days earlier because it was proof to me that, oh, this affection is based off of the man they met 22 days ago who has n is not a celebrity, who is not now a famous movie star. This is just only based off of the man they met 22 days ago, and they don't know me from, from John or Jane Doe. I needed that to just go, okay, you are this man. You're this man first before you were what you become the celebrity. And that helped ground me quite a bit and gave me some courage and confidence to continue on this journey of figuring out who I am, who I want to be, <laughs> um, and, and trying to do it as, as well as I can. And do you think as somebody who was an actor and was pursuing big things and big movies, were you somebody that was looking for that love and that attention more than, say, your average person? Um... I don't think I was, I don't ever remember looking for the love and the attention. At the same time, I'm, I mean, I love people's approval. And with approval, I understood from especially the, the Hollywood system and even the approval of, you know, they, they go part and parcel. Your movie does well. That means uh, the, the, the public is, is approving what you're doing. They're coming to, to the show. 
that also that that feeds the Hollywood system to say, well, okay, this person brings in box office people. Pe- this person's in demand. So they're giving me approval. With that comes more options to do the kind of work you want to do. Bigger, you know, very successful directors that could that could cast anyone were coming to me first. So it wasn't that I was looking for the love and the approval. I was looking for, hey, I want to be able to do, I would love the option to be able to do what, what movies I want to do, to act in what movies I want to do. And just as that's what I'm wishing for, whop, it came on like an avalanche which go back to what I was saying five minutes earlier. It's like, oh boy, this is what you wanted. Now, what do I do? I need, like I said, I need some discernment here. I need some clarity. So I I don't know. Did it feel good? Yes. Did it feel good to have that approval? Absolutely. Did it feel good to have, to be, you know, the proverbial to whatever level, the toast of the town at that time? Did it feel good to look at them, to go through a, uh, go get my groceries and look over and see myself on the cover of three magazines? Yeah, felt great. That was cool. I was like, check this out, man. I'm going to enjoy this. Um, but with that, it was, you know, topsy turvy. It was, it was work to find my balance in that. And to tr- it was also very hard work to try and gracefully accept that. Did I have a little bit of imposter syndrome? Sure. Did I have a little bit of small town? Oh, I don't deserve this. Why me? Yeah, I had all that. With that, did some of that, did, did some good old Irish Jewish guilt come with me on that? Sure. You know, but I mean, I tried to gracefully say, hey, you know, hard times are coming and you know you've been through enough hard times in the past. A- appreciate this. Look this in the eye and try to own the what appreciation you can of this moment that you're in and, and, and the options and affluence that you just stepped into. It's incredible at that time you had the wherewithal to take a step back and take that pause before you, you know, just started saying yes to different things and and kept moving forward, especially as somebody who's, you know, you had just made it big. You you have another period that maybe we'll talk about later where you were doing the rom-coms and then you decided to take a little bit of a pause because you wanted to pivot in a different direction. This is different. This is like, Matthew, you finally have everything you want. Yeah. And everybody's got got the contract in front of you, you know, can you sign this and 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 start on this next film? And and, and again, the money too. Like at that time, you were yeah. probably still, you know, you know, money wasn't as plentiful. And so what do you think it was about you to have that wherewithal at such a young age, at the beginning of success, to take time to pause? I think I had some amount of understanding and courage to go, I want to know why I'm choosing to do the work I want to do. I I, I don't know if I'll make the best decision of my next project when I can do anything. I don't know if I'll do that, but I, but I, but I want to make a choice. I want to make an affirmative choice that I understand why I made the choice. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, but I know I made the choice. What I don't want to do is go through this going, wow, that less impressed, more involved quote that I have early in the book. I I, I knew that I had to be more than just impressed to be with where I was. Now, again, I didn't know if I was going to make the best decisions, but I wanted to know why I was going to make the next decisions when I could make any decision I wanted to make. And then I didn't want to go through this time going, wow, what do you think I should do? I always made my own decisions. I always made my own decisions. I would seek counsel and talk to my agents, et cetera, people I was getting to know well. Um, and they were good listeners, but I always, have always made the final decision. No one's ever told me, I've never done just what someone told me they think I should do. I never had an agent or a manager that's like, I got this. Let me tell you what the next move is. No, I I didn't. I, I wanted to make the decisions. I wanted to be the pilot of my choices and at least know why I was making them. I didn't want to go through this thing, either one numb and going, look up five years later and going, I don't know what I've been doing, but how was it? And I also didn't want to go through five years, 10 years, a career of success or not success, and then look back and go, I just listened and did what they told me I should do. You know, I want to know. I wanted to. And so I went on. 
And I want I chose actually very what I would call philanthropic movies after that. Movies and stories and characters that I thought should be shared with the world that I thought would be good education and enlightenment in the world. Amistad, Steven Spielberg, Contact with Zemeckis. Those were movies that a lot of the studios and 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 people that were part of the decision makers in my life and all around Hollywood were like, why is he doing those? He's not the lead. I remember, you know, why are you taking, you're taking the role that Jodie Foster's the lead in contact? Well, you can do one of these. And I had other pictures where I was the lead, but I was like, no, these are, I want to be a part of these stories where I was on my own spiritual journey. It's part of the reason I wanted to do a film like Contact. I wanted to, I thought, I thought that the, uh, the middle passage in the story of Amistad that Spielberg was telling was something like, like, I didn't know about it. And boy, to put that out, to pull it out of a history book and put it in a piece of entertainment in a movie, what a great way to educate. So I was already thinking that way. Um, and that was what I needed to do uh, and chose to do at that time for me. And after those two movies, which um, were the first two out of the gate after A Time to Kill, Okay, when I came out at the top of the peak out of a time to kill, I do those. They do decent. They do they do well. But for me, for the Matthew McConaughey star, it lowered. Well, it was a it was a it was a uh, uh, it was the second or third lead. Uh, it wasn't playing the the, the 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 handsome hero, whatever that whatever those things were. My it dipped, and people were like, "Well, why'd you do those?" I never regretted doing those. Never. And still would at all. At all. I was very honored, honored with those pictures. But people could argue, well, from a, a manager or an agent could argue, you could argue, a consultant could argue. If you're trying to be selfish to go choose roles that are going to raise your status and give you raise your raise your star, those would not be the two to do at that time. But I, they were very clear to me. And I understood why I did them and 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 then thoroughly enjoyed the experience and grew within the making of those. Gotcha. I want to come back to the beginning of the story where this book all sprung from, and that is your journal entries. So you started journaling all the way back at age 14, which, I mean, there's there's probably, you know, a group of people that start journaling that young, but, you know, it takes a unique person to to pick it up at that age and especially continue it on over the years. Yeah. So come back to 14 and talk about what was happening in your life that you decided, you know, I got to start writing this down and, and keeping a log? So 14, you're going through puberty. You're coming into adolescence that age-ish. Things are changing with your body. You're starting to get some new freedoms. You got a driver's license coming up. You just got a, you know, just had a good girlfriend. Just broke up with me. Why? Getting some pimples on my face. Why? <laughs> you know, all those questions. It could have been the mink oil. It, oh, it, it, it was the mink oil just about one year later. And that was not just a few pimples on the face. If you want to real laugh at me, check out the mink oil story in Green Lights. So there was, I think it was just the awkward time of, uh, that any adolescent goes through. Um, now, you know what the thing is, 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 is you bring up a question I haven't really I like I I've thought about it and I think it's worth talking about those like why did I continue Um I tell you what happened is I started to notice I would go to a movie theater watch a film and laugh at something in a full theater and I was and noticed and then get nervous at the end cuz I was the only one laughing at that and I remember is that okay to laugh at that and then the joke in the in the theater that the whole theater would laugh at I would be like what was so funny about that? And I'm um, starting to go, what, are you, is this okay? Are you, are you, little, are you weird, McConaughey? And then I remember going, let's write it down. Let's document this damn thing. Let's remember this. And so I remember, I remember starting to have some, and all the way through college, some sort of honor and pride in noticing where maybe my reaction or feeling to a situation was seemed idiosyncratic or seemed to be on its own and not of the masses. Um, I so I would write these things down, my reactions of things that I thought were funny that no one else seemed to think were funny, things that made me mad that didn't seem to make other people mad, things that made me cry where no one else cried. I would, I, you know, why I would, I've always cried at the birth of something. I'll ball at the story 
of the man who's released from jail 20 years later because he was wrongly incarcerated. That is a birth story to me. And I'm like, wow, man, that's beautiful. But I don't necessarily cry at the end of things, the death of things. I very quickly am like, my mind goes and heart goes, there's a beauty about the permanence, the, 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 the impermanence of, of life and the, you know, the fact that things are destructed to then be constructed. Maybe that comes from being a believer as well. Um, so I began to, I began to write these things down that, that I felt like where I was odd, where I didn't, I didn't have the consensus sort of, uh, uh, feel the world was not reacting the same way as I was to certain things. And I was going through a time going, well, let's write it down because, First, want to make sure you're not being a tyrant, McConaughey. Are you okay? Is this okay? And my diary was, my journals were my place to have my Socratic dialogue with it and to be a little bit more objective about it. And then, as, as I said, I started to take honor in these things where maybe I was a little bit different. So I continued to write. Now, we all know that when we have a journal, we usually go to it when we're in trouble, when we're confused, when we're down, when we got questions. And yes, the big question, WH, why? <laughs> the existential question of why was 80% of my early journals. Why? What are we doing here? What am I doing here? What's my purpose? Why did that person react to this? Why did the world do this? Why? 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 I remember back then, why? Where there was like the, there was like in high school, there was the, you know, the idea that the, the, the Russians were coming and you could hear a plane go to Mach 2 and everyone would go, oh, you know, Take cover. And you're like, no, it's just a plane going to Mach. But there was like these scares and you know, how much of it was factual or not, or just in our, my 17-year-old mind, I'm not sure. But the why question, the existential question of why was on my mind a lot. What's the purpose of life? The meaning of life? Uh, what am I doing in it? What, what agent am I in it? Um, and then I started to get some answers. I started to get some times in my life where I was succeeding. Times where I was on my frequency, so to speak. I started to succeed. I started to have some successful relationships with people, different ages, elders, women, men, children, a job. I started to get like a successful sort of dance in life. My grades were good. I'm going to college. This is all I, I get. I'm in a flow. I continued to write then. And I remember telling myself, you need to continue to write now that you feel like things are figured out. Because I had a hunch. Small hunch. It was a minority hunch, but a hunch that it won't always be like this. Because you know how it is. When things are going well, we're like, perfect. I found it. That's the meme. I got it. Locked. I can't lose it. There's no way to lose this. I got it. It's so clear. It's so simple. Well, eh, we know that <laughs> either we will implode the situation or something will happen in the world from the outside that will implode our situation. And we'll be off the rails again, trying to figure out what the hell's going on to get back on frequency. So I wrote down things. I remember writing to myself, dissect your success, man. Dissect when you're happy. Dissect when you're sleeping well. Dissect when your relationships are going well. Dissect when you're laying down at the end of the night and you see the, the day clearly where you see that your relationships evolved from yesterday, where you feel like you grew, where you feel like you were honest, where you, you know, you, you, you sacrificed something and it paid off tomorrow. So I started dissecting those things and shoot, I mean, a lot of that, as I get to this point in this conversation, a lot of that's kind of what the book is about. Um, sacrifices, delayed gratification, mixed with a lot of immediate gratification. I think the book's a lot about sometimes how we have to write the headline for where we want to go in life. Write the headline first and live your story to it. But it's also at least a balanced mix of don't chase the headline. Jump off and take the risk and figure out how to fly on the way down. Just tie your shoes and get out the damn door. That's the hardest part. Go give it a shot. Don't know what's going to happen. You know, with those walkabouts. I don't know. They were one-way tickets. What was I going to look for? I don't know but I'm just going to put myself in a position where hopefully what I need to know lands on me or I figure it out. Um, so, and that's, that's a lot. I think is, is in there lies the art of living for all of us. We want to have goals. We want to have ideas and aspirations that we seek 
that we chase. They're written. Write them down. Chase it. At the same time, you know, the, 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 the hands of coincidence and fate and magic that happen in life, be open to that and being inspired along the way and find yourself taking a route that you didn't plan on taking. That's the jump off and figure out how to fly on the way down. Just go put, just sometimes I say, I say this in the book, it's not always about what decision we make. Just make one and commit to it. Just do it. Don't be caught in limbo of measuring, well, should I do this? Should I do this? Day and day and day and day and day again. All of a sudden you look up, it's a year, two years. I got, it's a decade later. It's a lifetime later. When you're just like, man, back then, just it did, the, which decision didn't matter as much as just taking one and going with it and finding out. Matthew, when you were talking there about periods of your life when you were in flow and things were clicking for you, what were some of the big consistencies that you see over and over again when you were going through those periods? One was um, I was getting enough sleep. (laughs) I've always been a nine and a half hour guy, if I can get it. I was getting enough sleep. Fatigue is is one of my uh, greatest enemies. Um, my, My... the synapses of my brain don't don't work as well. I get short circuited here if I don't have enough rest. So getting enough rest. Um, who I was hanging out with. I had times where you know I would go to one bar with one group of friends, have the same drink and the same amount of drinks, but wake up much more hungover than when I went to this other bar with another group of friends and had the same drink and the same amount of drinks. So I was like, well, why am, why am I hung over? Well, it wasn't really the drinks. It was who I was hanging out with. What were our conversations about? Maybe we were gossiping too much, talking, having a good time at other people's expense who weren't there. That gave me a hangover. More so than going and having the same drink, same amount of drinks with friends who we were talking about good stuff, constructive stuff at our own expense. How to be better men. What's life about? What's happening? Great conversations, not objectifying people, you know? Um, um, and, and so that was some of the things. Also reading, I had this book, The Greatest Salesman in the World, which was my companion. And I read that morning, noon, and night every day for 10 months. And I've done it two full times. And that, as my own personal ritual that I was committed to, really kept me anchored in a time where I'm young 20s. I'm going through figuring out who I am still, trying to look for opportunities, trying to enjoy my college life at the same time, keeping an eye out for what does this really mean? Where are we going from here? Um, That book kept me really, really uh, anchored because it was me and mine. It was my secret. I was only reading it with me. I didn't read it to anybody else. And I read it morning, noon, and night, 10 months straight, and then did it again. And so that book really helped me keep the bit my bearing. That book was the greatest salesman in the world. Um, what else? Um, you know, I started to realize, okay, maybe my college education and my GPA, especially after I went to film school, maybe my GPA doesn't really it matter as much for where I'm going to go. But I understand that Mom and dad are paying for my education. If I make grades, they're happier. If they're happier when I go home for holidays, we have a lot better time at the holidays. <laughs> so little things like that where I was like, this class, I don't think really matters for what I'm going to be doing when I get out of get out of school and go on with my life. But let's let's make the grade. Uh, there's delayed gratification in that because I'll be getting along with my parents better, even at that most base level. But I also at the same time no, started to notice very quickly oh, there were classes that I was taking when I was in film school. I was like, I'm learning more. I learned more when I started making C's instead of when I was making A's in a lot of my college classes. Here's what I mean. I started taking internships. I was going outside of the classroom getting practical education in storytelling, in film production 
A lot of that meant sometimes I was skipping class. I was running off to San Antonio and Houston and Dallas in the middle of the day, in the middle of class, because my pager would go off because I had a possible audition to be in a music video. I was chasing things that I was like, oh, this could help you when you get out. And I had to talk with the dean of the school and my teachers who were not happy about me missing classes. And I told them what I just told you. I said, I'm chasing down the practical stuff that you're teaching to me. I'll be here for the major exams, but man, if I, 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 can I, I just, can I pass? Well, I ended up making C's. That last year that I made C's, I learned a lot more than when I made the A's and was just like, no, I can't go. I don't need to go chase anything outside the class. I just have to be a bookworm. And I was a study bug. I was a, I was a, I got into film school, not because I had a piece of art. I got into film school because I had a 3.82 GPA. I mean, I, I, I made, I, I was, a, I love days. Um, but I started to realize that while those were important, and I think this is important today, and I'm by no way telling any youth out there, hey, don't worry about your grades. What I am saying is today, be looking for the practical, experiential way of learning and try the sooner you can get into that in school, even back down to high school or even junior high. If you can get an intern, that, you know, that three weeks of work I had on the set of Days Confused taught me more than two years of film school because I was, it was practical. It was there. I was in it. It was a privileged position to be in. But anytime we can find something in real life, even if you've got to go do it for free, go do it. Um, yes, there's value in what you learn from the book, but also if you can get the experiential learning um, out there in life. So I was chasing that down um, at, at starting in my junior year of college. And you spoke about dazed and confused there. And the only reason you got that part is because you're out and about and, and you weren't, you know, say in that night studying, you were out at a bar when you met Dawn. So, right. Oh, gosh. I'm so glad I wasn't at the library. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Tell that story of running into Dawn. And this is how everything, you know, got propelled into action. Yeah. And, and look, you know, we all, when we look back at our lives from this moment on, the dots connect. But it's all a mystery going forward. And so I'm going to start this story where this was very mysterious how things add up. And it's very fun to look back and see how the dots connect. I decided to go out to the top of the Hyatt one night with my girlfriend. And the reason I'm going to the top of Hyatt is because I know the bartender. He's in film school with me and he'll give me a free drink. That's why we go there. We get there. He brings me a vodka and tonic, brings my girlfriend a vodka and tonic. And he says, hey, let me introduce you to this guy down there in the bar. He's been hanging out in the bar each night. He's in town producing a film. He takes me down and introduces me to him. His name is Don Phillips. Well, cut to four hours later. Me and Don Phillips are getting along great. Uh, many vodka and tonics later. Um, and we, he's on top of a table telling a story about a dog leg left on a, on a 17th fairway and, a, and, a, and on a TPC course that he played that I got to play. So we're visualizing the shot and going through. And all of a sudden, we're getting quite loud. The minute We get kicked out of the bar. Um, I'm now going to go back home and I'm in a taxi cab and he, he wants to ride with me to go drop me off. We ride uh, or on the ride home. He's like, Hey, Hey, uh, Matt, you ever done any acting? And I was like, Hey, you know, I was in a middle light commercial for this long. I did this Trish Yearwood video, blah, 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 not much. He said, well, you might be right for this part. You know what? Come to this address tomorrow morning, which by this time it was like, Six hours from now, one of the nights I was not going to get nine and a half hours sleep. Come and pick up this this uh, uh, script. It'll be waiting for you. Uh, it's a part named a guy named David Wooderson. You might be just right for it. Well, I go pick up this script. It's got, it's marked. It's got three scenes that this character Wooderson's in. And this character Wooderson's a guy, he's 21. He's out of high school. He's still hanging around high school, trying to pick up the high school chicks. It's, it's funny. He's a funny character. And he has this one line in there which I've now termed as a launch pad line and, and found, tried to find launch pad lines throughout my career and characters. But the one line was he's sitting out in front of the, the, the billiards joint. High school girl walks by, he checks her out. And his buddy says, you better cut that out, Wooderson. You're going to end up in jail, man. And Wooderson says, nah, man. That's what I like about those high school girls, man. I get older. They stay the same age. Well, I read that line and just started howling with laughter going, who is that? What person? I go, what if that person's not saying that for like as a joke or to be cool or as a timely little one-off? What if that that is that person's ethos? What if that person is like, 
I have found my place <laughs> in the world and it's to hang around. And I was like, what if that person thinks that that's their constitution? They got it figured out. So all of a sudden I start to see the character Wooderson is not a, oh man, what, oh, I'm so sorry for that guy. He, I started to see this guy as he, in his own life. He's a hero. He's got it figured out. It's the salad days for him. Well, that line turned me on to who the guy was. And I started, and I immediately, in my imagination, went to back when I was 11 years old. And my mom and I went to go pick up my brother, Pat, who was my hero at high school because his car broke down and we needed to pick him up in this one certain spot and he was not there. So we're driving around the campus in the station wagon. I'm in the back looking out the back window, looking for my brother, Pat. My mom's going, where is he? He's not here. And I see this figure about 60, 70, 80 yards away. In the shadows of an overhang on the side of the school, leaning against a brick wall, silhouetted by the back sun, smoking a cigarette with a with one leg kicked up and a knee out. And I was like, wow, who is that? And as I say that, I go, it's Pat. It was an iconic image. He looked nine feet tall, a Marlboro man, whatever. And as I said this, Pat, and my mom went, what? And I went, oh, nothing. Because I immediately knew, like, oh, he'll get in trouble if mom sees him smoking a cigarette. So I didn't say anything. So we kept driving. Well, that image, I was like, that's Wooderson. So all of a sudden, my mind, imagination goes to writing the book on Wooderson um, based off of that line and that image of my brother that I saw. So I get invited to work one night, not to work, but my first night, I'm there to do a makeup wardrobe hair test, which is where you step in a trailer, they go through the makeup, the hair drobe, uh, the hair and the wardrobe, the director, Richard Linklater, steps off a set, comes over, looks you up and down, gives you some notes, and then you go home and you come back later after all that's been approved and work another day. Well, on this particular night, I step out, Linklater comes over, looks me up and down, and says, okay, I, I, I like this, I like this. I'm like, okay, cool, man, I'll see you uh, next week. He's like, oh, hang on a second. He goes, you think Wooderson would maybe be interested in the redheaded intellectual girl? I'm like, oh, yeah, man. Wooderson likes all kinds of girls. He's like, well, Marissa Rabisi's playing that role. And she's over here at this place called the Top Notch drive Through. She's got her kind of nerdy friends in the back seat, And, you know, it's the last day of school. Maybe, you know, maybe you want to try and choose a scene where you pull up and try and pick her up. And I'm like, sure. Well, next thing I know, I've got a lavalier mic being hooked up to me. I'm sitting in my car about to do this scene. Marissa Rabisi's over there in the car with the nerdy friends, and I'm going to, on action, I'm just told, I don't know, I'm just pull up and go pick her up. Well, I'm starting to get a little a little anxious about like, okay, well, who's my man? Who's Wooderson? What is Wooderson about is what I'm going through in my mind. We know that line, that launch pad line. We know that image of my brother. And to myself, I say to myself, okay, Wooderson is about, about my car. And I'm like, well, you're in your 70s Chevelle right now. There's one. I said, I'm about rock and roll. I said, well, when we got Ted Nugent stranglehold in the eight track, we're rocking to that. There's two. I said, Wooderson's about getting high. I'm like, well, Slater, the stoner of the schools, riding shotgun. He's always got a doobie rolled up. There's three. And then I hear action. And I look up at Cynthia, played by Marissa Rabisi, the redheaded intellectual that I'm supposed to go pull up and Try and pick up in the scene. And I say to myself, as I put it in drive, and Wooderson's about picking up chicks. Pull out slowly. And on the way, I'm go I tell myself, well, you got three out of four, Wooderson. Going to get the fourth. All right, all right, all right. Those were the three affirmations that I was verbally giving myself that I had going to get the fourth. So I was batting 750 out of 1,000. And that's the first three words I ever said on camera. And it's off screen if you watch the movie. It's the introduction of the character, but it's it's off screen. And somehow that stuck and is still around in the vernacular. Um, see how many, well, that was 92, however many, 29 years later. And um, that's where that came from. And so I work that night, improvise a scene that works. Rick invites me back the next night, the next night, the next night, the next. I work for three weeks. All of a sudden, I'm written into the script as a central character. Um, 
and loved it and was leaving every day. I was getting paid SAG, 320 bucks a day. People are patting me on the back going, you're really good at this. I'm going, this is so much fun. Is this legal? Uh, yes. Would you like to come back tomorrow? Yes, I would. Had as the summer of my life and did not know at the time if I was starting what would be just a hobby, but I had a hunch that I'd found what it is I wanted to do. And it turned into be much more than a hobby, as you know. It turned into be a career 29, 29 years later. I love but that I, story. I have that vodka and tonic. Thank you for going so deep into that. I love that story. And when it comes to the all right, all right, all right, did you pre-think that at all? Like, did you know when they said action that was going to come out of your mouth? Or did no. was it totally spontaneous? Totally spontaneous. It, it was Look, it was the three affirmations in, of what I did have. And it was me gearing up. It was like It was like a a trigger for myself and my character. And it just kind of came out and it, I did, you know, obviously Wooderson's the kind of guy who wouldn't go, okay, okay, okay. Or yes, yes, yes. He was, you know, he was a legato guy. All right. All right. All right. He was that he's legato, not staccato. Also, I had been listening to a Doors live album where Jim Morrison barks at the crowd. All right. All right. All right. All right. Four times. I didn't think about that line for Wooderson, but that I, it's no coincidence that that was in my head now. And I remember even when I was saying the line, Wooderson wouldn't bark those three lines. Morrison barked them. Wooderson would throw them out like lanyop and more butter and syrup on my pancakes, please. You know what I mean? And they came out. It was not planned. I had no plan. There was nothing scripted. There was nothing. It was just me giving myself, you, to, you Wooderson, have three things that you're about. And the four things you're about, you're going to get the fourth. Wow. Life's peaches, man. Where else would you rather be? I'm in the honey hole. It's the salad days. It was because that's who Wooderson was in my mind. He was that guy who's like, no, I got this all figured out. And so that's why that's where the three all rights came from and why I said them like they did. And, you know, Wooderson had that little head kick back on the shoulders way about him, you know, which is my brother in that smoking section that day when I was 11. That's amazing. And it's interesting because this is the beginning of your career and, and everything's kicking off and things are going well in that respect with film. But at the same time, right at the beginning of filming that movie, your father passed. So five days talk, in. Yeah. Talk about that paradox where you're on a high because you're finally getting to live that dream. But then you hear, you get a call from your mom and you find out pop passed away. And, yep. and it wasn't like he was sick for a long time. You didn't, you didn't know this was coming. So talk about that turmoil that you must've went through mentally, having so much excitement plus so much sadness at the same time. Yeah. Well, so here I am. I just start. I get my big break. Again, I don't know if it's just a hobby or career, but I got a hunch, man, that I'm loving this. I'm being told I'm good for it. I feel like everything's adding up. This is the great, I mean, it's like, am I finding myself? Am I finding what I want to do? At the very least, my storytelling career has taken a big step forward, and this is so much fun, and they're telling me I'm really good at it. Wow. So the most important thing was going on in my life that had happened so far, as far as identity and what are we going to do? What am I going to do in life? What am I going to be? And five days into that high, I get the call that my dad died of a heart attack. Ah, uh, Well, as we know, things like that happen in your life. It doesn't matter what high you're on. That becomes, again, talk about clear purpose, as we talked about in the beginning of that becomes clear purpose. Okay, drop. It doesn't matter where we are, what we're doing. You, there's, you don't need salutations to go check in with everybody and go, hey, everybody, I think I'm going to go. No, you go. You just leave and they can all handle the why, whatever you're doing. So I, bam, it was on an evening and he had died that morning. And um, then I made a cup of coffee and hit the road and drove the three and a half hours to Texas and back to Houston, I mean, and spent it in there with my two brothers who were already there and my mother. And we spent a couple of nights late night in the kitchen for whatever reason i always find out about death in the kitchen and 
I always have discussed whenever there's been death or anyone around us, we always end up talking about we we there could be a beautiful couch and set of, and table and chairs, and my family will end up being up till sunlight sitting on the kitchen counters talking about the loss of someone. I don't know why I bring up that detail, but it's been consistent in my life. So we have those two long nights, and death makes me extremely tired. Talk about fatigue. It makes me narcoleptic. And I would sleep even on the kitchen counter and then wake up and, you know, you're kind of walking around and trying to figure out what to do. And my oldest brother's getting things organized because he was really close with my dad and was handling the will. And I'm whatever, 20, 21 and, 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 and trying to figure out what it's about. What's my place here? Um, we have then have an Irish. We have a wake, which my dad wanted. So he has friends come in from all over the country in for his wake. Um. I was, you know, being the youngest and my dad being my ultimate sort of aspirational hero and what he had taught me about honesty and, 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 and being respectful, et cetera. I, I, I took the proverbial mic in the wake and called out a lot of people that were friends that I thought maybe owed him money or something. I was the I was the 20 year old revolutionary in the thing. And you're going to do this and you're going to pay mom back. And blah, blah. Meanwhile, my oldest brother's in the back going. Because he knew the business dealings much better. Like, well, that guy, dad owes that guy as well. Don't be calling him out. They had their thing. Trust me, I saw that transaction go down. And I'm calling people out, putting people to task. And you'll pay my mom, bup, 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 bup. Um, I then hang out a day or two more and the family goes, okay, you got to get back. I had no pressure from uh, from Linkletter Austin to come back. It was it was a it was a one way ticket home. Obviously, when you do something like that, but my family said, "Get back and go. You got to go back and go finish what you started." That's what Dad really, really would want. You know, you called him two years ago and said you wanted to go to film school and no law school, and he said, "Don't half ass it." Well, going and finishing this job is part of not half assing it. So I go back. I drive back to to Austin, and I drive basically straight to set. And it was an evening. I would arrive around sundown. And uh, now, you know, however grounded I was and ready to ready to perform before Pop passed away, now I'm really grounded. You know, you lose somebody. Talk about sober. And I, you're, I'm high on this thing. I'm acting. I got a job. Oh, my God. Wow. I talk about being impressed with that. Well, lost to my father. I'm not. I'm not impressed with to having my first job as an actor at all now. There's nothing impressive about that. It's like, let's do this. I'm happy to be here. I respect it, but I'm not in awe of it. So I was really grounded at this point, coming back over to my father's death. And I remember walking around with Richard Linkletter, and Richard's a great listener. He's a really good friend that way. And he and I had already started to, even in our knowing each other for about only a week, it started to enjoy our philosophical conversations about the why, those things that we wrote in the journals back when I was 12, those, what are we doing here? And I remember just kind of saying, you know, my father's no longer physically here, but I can keep his spirit alive. I can talk to him when I want to. I can, me being back here, continuing this work is keeping his spirit alive because he told me, don't half ass it. That's carrying on. That's keeping him alive. If I do, if I do my best at this job, it's keep. If I keep the values of not hating and not saying I can't believe and you can't pull something off and like that's keeping him alive. That I just, if I keep those alive, I he just just keeps living. And that when I came out of my mouth, that's when it anchored in me right there. I was like, oh. Well, that seems to be what it's all about right there. Just keep living. Not only for keeping somebody else alive spiritually in our lives when they're physically gone, but for us that are here alive. What else are we going to do? The alternative more than sucks. Just keep living. And it came out of my mouth in a scene that night on the football field. Randall Pink Floyd was going to sign. He was going through a debate about do I sign the drug contact or do I play the football? And I, and again, a fully improvised thing. I didn't have any plans. It came out of my mouth and said, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't care which one you choose, but whatever you do, Randall Pink Floyd, you got to just keep living, man. L-I-V-I-N. And I do. It came out of Wooderson's mouth that night. So I was 
who I where the, where I just come from. My father passing. It was coming now out of the character, hopefully in a way that was true to the character. But I I was uh, um, that that grounded me as people know who who lose a loved one. That was extremely grounded by that. Um, and you know you lose a loved one, you sober up. And I don't mean sober up off of something that you're taking and putting in your body from outside. I mean, you, your soul sobers up. Your way you look at the world sobers up. And I remember the first lesson after the Just Keep Living was be less impressed, more involved. And that's continued to be something that I think is very valuable to, um, to keep in mind. Uh, because I lost, you lose a loved one that's close to you, you, you lose a lot of reverence for mortal things in the world. And I think that's very healthy. Don't lose respect for these mortal things, but we can be blinded by our reverence for mortal things, fame, money, success. We can be blinded so much so that we're not involved in them. Back when I got famous off of Time to Kill, wow, the impression of all this stuff. I was not involved with it. Hell, how could I be? I, I didn't feel myself. I was numb. I needed to get the hell out of there to go hear myself think so I could come back involved in the situation less impressed, more involved. Um, and that was a second big lesson that came out of my father's moving on and I ended up working for the next uh, um, two weeks and continued to love what I did and um, have tried to maintain my conversations with my father whenever I want to, those awkward times of picking up a phone to try to remind myself, well, don't stop dialing now that you just remembered he's no longer here, dial. Talk, shoot it out, have a conversation, have a laugh, have a cry, anytime, anytime. And uh, yeah, try to keep that up. Um, I'm I'm do a good conversation. I miss him when when I'm, I miss him now that I got kids. They they I miss him around. I miss the I I see I laugh a lot of times at jokes that I know he would have with my wife. Now that he didn't get to have, I miss sharing a script with him. He would have loved reading a script and go, oh, buddy, you know who this guy reminds me of? There's this old boy I met. Ba-ba-ba. He'd have loved that. You know, he'd have loved the creative process. So, yeah, he moved on. Um, it was what it was, uh, 92, five days into 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 working on uh, Days Confused. So there is great serendipity that I felt very early on. That he was alive in this life to overlap five days of me starting something that became more than a hobby. He was alive for me to start. So he didn't get to the set. He didn't get to see it, but he got to be alive for me starting something that would become a career, something I wouldn't half-ass, something that wouldn't be just a, oh, I did that for a summer, you know, or, oh, I, I oh, 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 that was a fad, you know, something that I turned in to say, no, that's, that's, that's a career. Your legacy. Yeah, it's beautiful. And as you're talking about all this, I know you got to go, but I have one last question for you. Is your mortality something you personally think about often and use that as a driving force in your life and in your work? No. I'm, I'm going to steal my mom's line here because she says it and it's so true. And it's, it's, it's my default of where I have noticed is more the way I think about it. I'm not trying, I'm not, I don't, I don't have, I'm not hung up on mortality. I'm not trying to live longer. I can't imagine not being alive. I still live like I think I'm going to live forever. I know I'm not. There's a, there's a great, uh, Dan Butner's a friend of mine. He started Blue Zones. Found these, he's found also he's found centurions, people that live the longest around the world, and he found that they are not trying to live longer. They just forget to die. And there's there's great freedom in that perspective. Um, I'm not, you know, yes, I yes, I try to take care of myself. I'm not foolish thinking I'm, I know it's impermanent this life. But I'm not, I'm also not obsessed with the highest number. I'm not obsessed with the number. I want to live the longest. I'd rather live, you know, 40 happy than 110 not. 
the, the, the amount is not what I'm chasing. I don't think about debt. I like, I enjoy when I do think about debt. I think we could all do that a little bit more. That's why I write in the book about, hey, what's your eulogy? Go ahead, talk, jump on out there. And the first reaction is, oh, I don't want to go there. No, dude, it's happening, especially since that's inevitable. Go there. It's a, it's a fun look back. It's one of the things we can rely on. And one of the things that we have control over what that eulogy is going to be. Now we have control of that. That's like, whoa, boy, if I was getting complacent, now I just got excited again. Uh, so I'm not obsessed with mortality. I just more think I'm going to be immortal. <laughs> I'm forgetting, well, I guess. Forgetting to, forget, I think I'm just forgetting to forget to die until I do. I like that. Well, I also like using that as a tool, thinking about it and using that as a tool to get grounded and present in the moment. Not that you're trying to live the longest, but it's like you're not being caught up in the day-to-day monotony of life when you think about death. It it, it grounds you. It wakes you up. Right. That That's what I was getting at. Using that as a tool to say like, I'm in today. I'm giving today all I got. You know, whether I'm here chatting with you like this or right. whatever I'm doing, whether whatever you're about to go do after we're done chatting here and spending time with your family, it's like I'm life is impermanent. So I'm going to be as present and as amazing as I can be in the moment right here, right now. So is right. that that is that something that you do? Yeah, hundred percent. And this leads to look. So people go. Life's impermanent, so it's all for nothing. Really? Is that the math you want to do with that? <laughs> because what you're saying, which I agree with, is when you realize and shake hands with the impermanence of life, that's when it's all for everything. That's when it's, why not? Instead of, but why? That's when it's, <laughs> yeah, because I want to. And you know what? I think I need to. Let's find out. Instead of, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'll get back to you tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. I, there's a great power. You know, it's that balance. Those see, those are seen as a contradiction a lot of times, what you just said. And, I, and I'm agreeing with you. I think there's great empowerment. You know, when I'm feeling the most close to God, I am most feel most humble as a little speck in the hands of time in the infinite palm of the prime mover. My life's nothing. It's a blip. It's like what, what? Nothing I'm doing matters. But in that humility of going, oh my gosh, how powerless maybe or or or, or, or uh, uh, non influential my life may be is like instead of going, oh, shoulders dropping, going, well, what do I need to get up in the morning? I start to feel like, all right. Here we go. Oh, thank you for the freedom. Thank you for the privilege. Thank you for the kick in the backside. Thank you for the ownership. Thank you for the head being higher, the heart being higher. And let's go find out and make see how much we can make today count. Extrovertedly and introvertedly. How much can, now let's really get on this investigation of who we are and what are we doing here. Now let's really try to figure out this mystery. Let's dive into it. it. Right there where I think we notice it feel like where we where we think it's all for nothing is where I believe we believe and then have the real true faith and understanding that it's all for everything. I love that. I think this is a beautiful place to end. Just to kind of summarize another thought I had while you're while you're riffing there, it's it kind of puts the fast forward button on the greeting somebody how's the weather how are you today and moves us into the deeper conversation like we had here today deeper things in life and 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 again i like your your thought there it can be between two people or it can be introspective as well getting beyond the shallow moving into the deeper stuff quicker and and getting into the meat of life and let's and let's remember this because you know the reaction when you have a conversation like this is people go whoa (laughs) That's deep. And they're, so they're sort of like, oh, it's got to be so, so serious. No. 
we've talked about some very funny stuff. <laughs> and to laugh at the, oh, hell, I don't know, is part of the conversation. It should be, uh, uh, so I don't think it needs to have that great weight of, oh my gosh, I don't want to get in that conversation. I may be in over my head. I haven't thought, laughter, you know, it, it, and, and, be, and going, hell, I don't know. Is part of the part of the fun part of the fun of this. We're not gonna we you and I could talk for decades, and we're not gonna get the answer. And that's the point. Stay in the chase, commit to the race, or wait, stay in the race, commit to the chase. Chasing yet our better selves, our truer selves, our more transcendent selves. What better, what better person to chase? What more fun person to chase? The one that each each and every one of us, the only one that each and every one of us are stuck with, the only one that each and one of, every one of us cannot, we have to do more than just date. We're married to ourselves, like it or not. So <laughs> my, if that's inevitable, I think relatively it's nice to look in the mirror and go, well, it's me and you, at least. Can't do anything about that. So where are we going, buddy? How are we going to do this? <laughs> Let's grow to love each other if we're not there yet. Heard. All right, Matthew, I really enjoyed the conversation. I know you got to go. Other than getting a copy of Green Lights, how can people connect with you after the show? Um, After the show, well, look, my truest extension of me that I've ever put out is, is, is Green Lights. I'm happy and honored to say that. Um, we are going to be doing work. I'm keeping people up on my Instagram at Officially McConaughey on what we're going to be doing with this Texas uh, um, relief uh, benefit. Uh, that'll, that'll be probably all of my exported information for probably at least the next two weeks. Um, trying to help people stabilize, understand safety concerns, what to do, what not to do. We, we've had some people didn't know some things like brought their barbecue pit into their house, lit it. Carbon monoxide was not good for that. Um, so we've got to educate some very simple safety briefs. Then, as I said, organize where the, where the funds need to be helped the most now and then how for the long term. Other than that, that's that's what's on my docket right now um, at my at officially McConaughey on my IG. And if you want to go on, find out about our foundation, the Just Keep Living Foundation. No G on the end of living. Um, there's some great info there on what we're doing. And um, then green lights, you're going to find out maybe more where I'm going or what's what's next from from that site. All right. I'm going to link it all up in the show notes. And Matthew, I'll be thinking of you guys in Texas, wishing you all the best. All right. And I thank you for your time. Jesse, thank you.